Great, thank I'm really delighted to be here. Um, recent uh, observations made by uh, missions over the last five or six years, and also sample studies have really revealed a very, very new moon. Uh, this moon has perhaps a, a wide variety of uh, volatile and hydrogen species reservoirs that were formed by numerous surface and internal processes. However, there are still various questions still remaining. For example, what is the nature of the hydrogen species in the polar areas, outside the polar areas, and within the lunar interior? Also, how are these uh, species transported? Numerous questions. Uh, the scientific and planetary community have really uh, understood that, that these are really important observations that are being made, not only for understanding the processes involved in the origin and evolution of the moon, but understanding solar system scale processes. These are just some quotes that I took from the planetary science in the next decade, the decadal survey, and you can see here understanding the origin and diversity of terrestrial planets are important. And then again, a quote from page 114, what are the volatile budgets in the interior surface and atmospheres of the inner planets. And one can just read through this document and find all sorts of important science that is closely tied to understanding the volatiles on the moon. In addition to the science importance and the science relevance for understanding processes in our solar system, uh, as I had mentioned yesterday, the League is uh, evaluating uh, strategic knowledge gaps, as the Human Exploration Group uh, hat has also done, and filtering through all of these tied to the moon are the quality and quantity and distribution of water, hydrogen species, and other volatiles in the lunar regolith, how one processes these volatiles, and again, uh, these common themes, these common SKGs, filter through all the destinations, the moon, near-Earth asteroids, and Mars. So important in terms of not only science on the solar system scale, but also important for human exploration. What I'd like to make a point, and this is different from uh, the other talks today, is focus upon samples and what samples have to offer us. They are key in making interpretations about volatile reservoirs on the moon. For example, samples provide ground truth for interpreting remote sensing data. You know, we've done this with mineralogy, but I think the same thing is true with regards to unraveling volatile reservoirs on the moon. They also provide details for lunar processes uh, and where these volatiles are and how they interact with more solid material on the lunar surface and how they're di distributed in the lunar interior and also identifying potential reservoirs uh, for, or resources for future human uses. Uh, you know, the Apollo samples have provided insights into the behavior of volatiles on the moon, and we've recognized at least how volatiles behave on the moon fairly early, right after the Apollo missions. But the question is, how well is this volatile record preserved in these samples? And then also, how can environmentally sensitive samples be better collected, processed, and preserved uh, beyond the Apollo program to essentially process uh, and collect 
and return samples, volatile rich samples from the moon, and obviously this feeds forward to other planetary bodies. You know, obviously one approach is to have a variety of precursor and discovery style missions that explore lunar volatiles in the regolith. This can be done at the poles perhaps and be done on the surface. I would argue that another step that one can take, not in replacing this, but a perhaps a first step, is really go back and look at some of the unopened Apollo samples. And there are several that are unopened and have never been studied. Uh, this diagram just illustrates the wide variety of uh, some of the Apollo containers that these materials have been brought back in. And again, many of them aren't really conducive to preserving a, uh, a volatile record. Uh, for example, the, the one in the up your upper left is uh, one of the uh, Apollo lunar sample rock boxes. Uh, this is a, on to your right, is one of the sample bags which contained the 74220 orange glass soil samples. And again, you can see in both those cases, they aren't necessarily conducive to preserving the volatile record. However, those people involved in Apollo were very insightful, not only for trying to get a better understanding of the volatile record, but also preserving these samples for future generations. And they have also collected during the Apollo missions samples in what are returned to special environmental sample containers, which are sealed, and gas and analysis sample containers. And some of these are still remain in the Apollo collection, and some of these remained unopened. Uh, there are there's a sample of 15014, which is a special environmental container that's sealed and has 333 grams. But I think the real treasure here are these core sample vacuum containers to your right. They contain between a half a kilogram and a, and a kilogram of sample, very similar to what you would bring back. Uh, and what's kind of unique is that these, when they were returned, were put into additional containers and preserved. Uh, this is the core sample vacuum container shown here. It has a weight of about uh, half a kilogram, a length of 41 centimeters, and an outer diameter of 6.1 centimeters. Uh, the seal on these uh, were these indium seals tied to a knife edge, and uh, the astronauts, once they collected the sample, they sealed it, and ideally the indium flowed up uh, in, around the knife edge, sealing the, sealing the canister. Uh, there are many cases, or some cases, where the seal didn't work, in which uh, you know, material got trapped uh, here. But in other situations, the containers did contain uh, gases from the samples, and uh, in the early 70s, one of these gas containers was sampled and analyzed. Now again, as I mentioned, there are two uh, CSVCs available. The one I think is the most important, at least right now for study, is 69001. Uh, this was a product of a single drive tube collected at Station 9. It was immediately placed within the vacuum container on the lunar surface, and upon return to the lunar receiving lab, it was placed in an additional vacuum container and sealed. So it's been in this container and in the Holy of Holies in the uh, lunar sample receiving lab since that period of time. It's never been opened. There's approximately uh, 558 grams and a length of about 27 centimeters. A perfect sample for initially doing these sorts of studies. Why now? Uh, there are pressing planetary problems and lunar problems that are tied to uh, missions and recent sample observations that we could use these samples. There are pressing problems tied to human exploration. There is substantial improvement 
in analytical technology since the mid-90s that we can utilize in analyzing sam these samples. And finally, what this also does, this exercise in going ahead and opening these samples, test collection, storage, curation of volatile bearing planetary materials that really feeds forward not only to the moon when we go back to the moon to collect volatile rich samples to better understand these reservoirs, but also it feeds forward to the asteroids and Mars. Why a consortium? Uh, lunar samples have had a wide history of being studied in a consortium sort of framework. Uh, Larry Taylor led just a really great consortium, I think this was in the late 70s, early 80s, right Larry? Called Vapor. Uh, which brought in a lot of scientists to study the Rusty Rock 66095. And again, a single coordinated processing allocation and analytical protocol is required, a single one, to maximize science and exploration, minimize sample corruption, and essentially lowering the cost of sample processing. There are numerous types of measurements that can be made both tied to volatiles, tied to organics, tied to dust, if you will, and, and reactive surfaces and dust. Here are just a couple uh, tied to science. Uh, one measurement of gas compositions in the container headspace, which essentially may, may not have terrestrial contamination. And these are the sorts of questions that we could potentially answer. Uh, also, the, we can do measurements of volatiles in the regolith itself, hopefully without any terrestrial contamination or alteration. And this may allow us to address questions, for example, uh, the origin of rusty rock 66095. You know, what is the origin of this rust? With regards to uh, human exploration studies, Again, one can measure volatiles in the most pristine lunar regolith samples. These are the sorts of questions that one can answer. One can make comparisons between the CSVC samples and adjacent regolith collected via alternative methods, again, to get a better understanding and insight how one collects and processes these types of samples. In order to move forward with this consortium, uh, one needs to very closely establish science and engineering goals uh, and establish a variety of protocols with regards to what analyses are done first, how one does handling and processing. And these all funnel through uh, CAPTEM, the Curation Analysis Planning Team, for extraterrestrial materials and JSC Aries curation. Obviously, uh, this is extremely important uh, to do and dictates what science and the order of science and measurements uh, are done. Okay, so in conclusion, both the Apollo 16 and 17 core sample vacuum containers have the highest probability for uh, preserving lunar volatiles and may provide us with a new sample perspective uh, for looking at these volatile reservoirs and volatile element behavior. You know, this is equivalent to a new sample return mission. These samples are preserved, perhaps, and have been collected uh, on the lunar surface in fairly large volumes. You know, this fulfills uh, numerous science goals in the decadal survey, filling strategic knowledge gaps, and linking to current and future missions and in interpreting that data. And also the cost involved in this is substantially less than the mission and involves the cost planning, preparation, processing, and curation of the CSVCs. And those people who are potentially interested in participating in this, that they have a unique measurement they would like to make on what could be uh, very unusual samples, uh, please feel free to get hold of me. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. I see two.
Yeah, thank you, Chip. That was very, very exciting. Um, I'd like to point out something because of this Rusty Rock situation. When I went back and checked on all the boxes and everything, there's nothing that contains a vacuum at 10 to the minus 12 torr. They've all leaked one way or another. Or they have, maybe they haven't leaked so much as they have, um, in the case of lunar soil, maybe this is some of the solar wind that's coming loose off the, the samples. That's right. And I think, you know, whenever you agitate these samples, there will be solar wind and volatiles that come off those samples. So that's one particular issue. And that's why you were kind of interested in measuring the head gas. But also, what I think is really unique about this particular sample, because I would assume by now these indium seals would have failed to some degree. But, you know, since their return, they've been in these other very well sealed uh, containers. And so, you know, the goal would be uh, to essentially tap and analyze the gas that, are in, that is in the container that contains the, uh, the core sample container. Yeah, the, the problem that we have with any kind of leakage is the fact that uh, water, which has a very long mm -hmm. mean free path, selectively leaks through itty bitty cracks. Yep. You know, so you're going to increase the humidity in there. That's something to always keep in mind. Yep. That's why we worried about the rusty rock. I found rust in 40 different samples. Yeah, I know you did, yeah. So that's, that's a problem. Is it really quick, Clive? I don't know. Um, uh, Chip, just, just listening to this, it would be good to have a... Uh...